So global variables. A global variable is a variable defined outside of all the functions in a program. And by the way, I need to send an email to you, one of y'all. Um, y'all did the function homework, but you didn't quite do it correctly. No problem, just redo it. Um, I'll post a notice why in your feedback, but I also wanted to email you. Use global variables. So what is a global variable? A global variable is one that looks like... I need to save this. So you have your pound sign includes whatever up at the top. You're using blah, blah, blah up at the top. You have your int main. And then say you have some other functions. You know, void my function. Who knows what it does. And you want the same data to be used in both of these functions. You want to be able to ask for somebody's height and weight. You know, height is equal to, you know, cin into height. cin into weight. But here, when you're going to calculate their BMR, you want to be able to use those variables. Now, there's two ways to handle that kind of stuff. One is you can pass them in. Parameters. Double height, you know, comma, double weight. And then when they want to, I think I misspelled something. No. Then when they want we, when we want to call that function, we just pass those variables in, like that, height, comma, weight. We get that stuff, we pass it in. Of course, we'd have to declare it beforehand, and we'd have to write out our questions, right? You know, enter your height, that kind of stuff. But fundamentally, that's what we would have to do if we were going to write this function that did something with that height and that weight and their age and their activity level, right, or whatever. But what if you had a whole bunch of functions that needed those same variables? You might not want to pass them into every single function. And actually, the use of global variables is frowned upon, but I'm going to show you how to do it anyways. What you could do is you could declare them outside of any of your functions. Double height, double weight, and then you wouldn't have to pass them in so that you could read them in down here in main and then when you were ready to uh, to process them you would just call BMR without passing in any arguments and they already would have you know double BMR is equal to super complex you know equation you know height and weight whatever it is do something like that. So you would not have to pass in height and weight as arguments. So you would not have to define height and weight parameters. You can instead stick them up here. So global variables are really deeply frowned upon nowadays. You could at least put them in a namespace. You could do something like this. Namespace BMR and you could put these guys in a namespace so that when you wanted to reference them, you would prefix them with our namespace like that, BMR height times BMR weight, right? And then down here, when we were going to read into them, CIN into BMR height, CIN into BMR weight, right? And so we'd read them in here, then we'd call do BMR, and it would use those variables. That's better, better than just using purely global variables. If you have to use global variables, I'd recommend going ahead and tucking them away in a namespace. The reason for that is, is that global variables are shared between all the CPP files in your code. If you write another CPP file that had the same global variable defined in it, another CPP file that you wrote in the same project that took something called height, then you'd have two variables with the same name and it wouldn't compile. But if you put them all in their own namespace, it's very unlikely that you're going to use that same namespace in, you know, two different CPP files. You could make, go to great care to make sure that you do not duplicate your namespaces, and then you never have to worry about global variable collisions. So that's a global variable. It's a variable that's used between more than one function, 
And so what the student did wrong is they used global variables for uh, their homework. If I go to the homework assignment, Writing simple functions. It's just not, not, not bad. It's just not correct, and you're going to have to redo it. So function descriptions. Hello. It returns nothing, but it takes as a parameter a first name. Okay, so what should this function look like? Let's go ahead and write this function. I should probably be doing this in C++ making. I'll do it with me. But anyways, void you know, hello, and it was supposed to take a first name like that, and what was it supposed to do? It was supposed to print hello to that person. C out, hello, comma, you know, and an arrow, arrow, followed by their first name, followed by, followed by India, right? And then down in main, you would call hello like that, you know, and you could pass in a first name. Something like that. So that would have been a correct solution to that part of the program. Here is what would not have been a correct solution. String first name, and along with all the other variables that the functions needed, there was another one that had a, a last name necessary as well. And then void hello, not taking any parameters. C out hello, comma. followed by the first name, followed by NDL, and then inside of main, setting that global variable, first name is equal to Jeff, and then calling hello, like that, right? It works, but it's using global variables and I wanted you to use parameters. So instead of writing it like this, where you're using global variables to shuttle your data between your functions, go ahead and write them like this so that they have the variables that I specified in the instructions as parameters. So the scope of a global variable is a portion of the program from where it is defined to the end. It means that the global variable can be accessed by all the functions in the code. You should avoid using global variables because they make programs difficult to debug. They date back to the 70s um, when the C++, excuse me, when C was first invented. And so they've been carried along in every version of C++, but they're not recommended to use anymore. And other languages like Java have eliminated the uh, option to have global variables at all. If you do make a global variable, it should be a constant. There's nothing wrong with st stacking up at the top of your code something like, you know, constant double pi is equal to 3.1415962, whatever it is, you know, like that. And then just using that throughout. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But to store data, to store non-constants, it's frowned upon. Works, but don't write your code to depend on global variables if you can possibly avoid it. And once you start doing object-oriented programming with classes, the idea of global variables disappears completely. You don't even have to worry about it. I mean, you could still use them, but absolutely do not because the tools that you use to implement object-oriented programming obviate the need for it completely. Whoops. So here, they've written some code that has some constants. The pay rate, apparently everybody at this company earns $22.55 an hour. Everybody in this company earns 40, doll, um, 40 hours a week, and their overtime is 1.5, whatever. So they've defined some constants up there. And then later on in their program, they have some functions. Here's their prototypes, get base pay, get overtime pay. And they use those functions later on. Somewhere else they use these constants to calculate the overtime and the base pay. Well, they don't actually show that, but if it would let us edit this, if it wasn't an image, I'd go ahead and have us uh, revise the code to do that. Well, they do show it. 
or on the next one, I didn't see that. So get the overtime pay, if any. If hours greater than base hours, greater than that constant, calculate the overtime. Base hour, base pay is equal to base hours times pay rate. And then they calculate the overtime based on hours worked minus base hours, whatever. You can see that the giant things, the capital letters, the constants kind of leap out at you that way. Absolutely nothing wrong with declaring constants as global variables. It's a recommended way of doing it. So local variables are not automatically initialized. However, global variables are automatically initialized. So if your code did this, this example I was showing here, where we had um, height and weight, if you printed out the height and the weight before you stored any values into them, since these are global variables, not local variables inside of a method, they would have default values. And it's about time to go ahead and, and open Visual Studio and play with some of this stuff. File new project. Empty project. create CPP file with all my usual boilerplate IO stream string CMath as my pound sign includes using namespace std int main system pause but not for the Mac users and by the way we wouldn't need that pause if every time we ran it we did it as debug start without debugging and we haven't been using the debugger I should make y'all use a debugger but there's nothing wrong with putting it in there it's just kind of a clumsy way of handling it alrighty and good enough Let's declare a global variable called, I don't know, um, int height, underscore in, underscore inches. Is that dumb? Yeah, it is. Let's just call it inches. Int inches. And out here, let's print out their height. Height equals, end quote, arrow, arrow, inches. And DL. We sure are talk, taking a long time to talk about global variables after we recommended you not use them. So this is going to work though. It'll print out zero. Why? Because nothing ever reads into that inches variable. But that's okay. It just demonstrates a point. And the point is that global variables do get initialized to zero, whereas local variables do not. Let's make another variable, but we're going to make it a local variable called pounds. So int pounds, and let's print out their pounds. C out, arrow, arrow, pounds equals, end quote, arrow, arrow, pounds, end quote. Error, error, ENDL. And it says there were build errors. And no, never click that, yeah, I want to go ahead and run it without recompiling it. Okay, and the error is error 4700. Kind of implies that there are massive numbers of errors available to us, yeah. Uninitialized local variable pounds used. 
So we couldn't do that one without assigning it a value. This one we were able to get away with. Global variables are initialized to zero. Local variables are not initialized. So we would actually have to give it a value. How does it equal to 180? Whatever. Then we could do it. Oh, yeah. What did it print when you ran it? Run it. Zero. Zero? Okay. I'm disappointed because Xcode in many ways is stricter than Microsoft's version of C++. Okay, so if I grade you wrong in a test question because yours behaved differently, you can go, hey, professor, it worked on my Mac. And I'll give you the credit. Okay, so... Let's go back and make that pounds variable a global variable. Just yank that out, that int pounds. Come and paste it up here under int inches. That comment is dumb now because it's not anything to do about local variables anymore. So I'm going to delete that. And I'm going to put this stuff in a namespace. So namespace. We're going to pretend this is a BMR calculator, even though we're not going to implement the whole thing. Oh, and I need to talk about the file I.O. assignment a little bit, but I'll get back to that. The one where we modified BMR to save to a file. Okay. So I could write a function here that would get that, those pieces of data. Void get input. We would write out some messages. See out. What is the patient's height in inches? And then we could see in into BMR colon colon inches. And then do the same thing for their height. See out what is the patient's weight in pounds. CIN arrow arrow BMR colon colon pounds. Now let's write another function. Void print underscore awesomeness. And your awesomeness is your height multiplied by your weight. It's just silly, right? So let's calculate their awesomeness. Int awesome is equal to BMR colon colon height times BMR colon colon weight. I've done something wrong because it's not height and weight, it's inches and pounds. So BMR colon colon pounds times BMR colon colon inches. And then we could see out your awesomeness rating is followed by that awesome followed by ENDL. So down in Maine, we could call. I'm going to delete that cout statement, these, both of these cout statements. So right now all main has is that system pause, but we're going to make a call to the get input function and then to the print underscore awesomeness function. And since this is as far as we have gotten in this class. We don't know how to do object-oriented programming into defined classes. This is actually an acceptable solution for this kind of thing. When I said it's not recommended as you learn other ways of handling this stuff, that would be better. But we have two pieces of data we care about. And BMR would also require int, you know, age and um, activity level. So that actually be four pieces of data we were shuffling around between the functions. You can't write a function like get input that would return two things. You know, I couldn't make a say, don't type this because it's not going to work. Return pounds, comma, inches, right? 
I can't type that because you can only have a return statement that accepts one thing, not two. In this language, in Python, you can't. So that wouldn't work. So there's no way to write a function that would return two values. And so if get input was supposed to return two or three or four values, you need another solution besides an input. Uh, excuse me, besides a return statement. Has to be a more um, has to be another solution besides that. And so in this case, our solution was to make those global variables. But to make it look a little bit cleaner, we put them in a namespace. Okay, my, my point about the file I.O. The assignment was to modify your file I, um, your BMR assignment to save to file. Now some people make that assignment far more complex than it needs to be. What they do is they save the height and the weight and the age and the activity index to a file. Then they open that file, they read in those four values, and then they calculate the BMR. That's not really what I wanted. All I wanted it to do was to, you know, where it says how many calories, you know, you burn per day. Just go ahead and print that out. Save that to a file. That's all you needed to do. So there was some see out statements towards the bottom of your BMR program where you told them their calories. You could instead, or in addition, create an OF stream, an output file stream, and then save your output there. So let's pretend that this program right here was our real BMR program, right? And we were going to modify it to save its output to a file. Well, here's its output. This is the input, but I didn't ask you to save the input to a file. I asked you to save the output to a file. So somewhere down in the bottom, it prints out the person's BMR, the calories, or whatever. So all you would have to do is to, and now we don't have an OF stream here, but if we did, we could do OF string, you know, out file, you know, out file dot open, you know, pass in our file name, whatever it was, you know, output dot txt, or we asked them for it. And don't type this because this is not going to work, and I'm not going to go back in and add the OF stream. And then once, you know, you validated it, if out file, meaning if it's good, then you could do out file arrow arrow, and then the same thing you had here. Out file arrow arrow, your awesomeness rating is that. Then you close your file like that, and you're done. You're done with the assignment at that point. That's really all he had to do is wherever you were printing out your final results, also save it to a file. And if you didn't print it out because you saved it to a file and that was the only thing you did, that's okay as well. If you made a super duper complex, yeah, you'll still get credit for it. But, I mean, why would I count you off for, for trying extra hard? But you didn't have to. Hope that makes sense. Delete. We could get that working, couldn't we? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so what do we need to do to get all this working? We need an extra include. So I'm going to go back up to the top and do pound sign include f stream. Seems like I see an error here, but I don't see it. Okay, it's got a closed brace there because I forgot my semicolon. possible that's going to work without any further changes. I was just winging it, but it's possible that I didn't give any syntax errors. If so, neat. Now I should go and look to see if that file, that output.txt, was really saved. And what I should do is I should have asked the user for their file name rather than just hard code that. But if I go and look in the project where this is stored, the directory in which this is stored, which I can always get to just by going to the Solution Explorer, right-clicking, doing Open Folder and File Explorer, I should be able to find an output.txt file in one of these directories. 
and here it is. And if I open it, your awesomeness rating is 600. Like that. Okay, I pretty much gave away the whole assignment, but that's okay. What is the, the if statement again? What does that mean? This means if it opens successfully. Okay. What if I tried to open something that I couldn't? Like I didn't have a file name at all. I'm going to put something else on the other side of that if statement so that I can find out if it failed for some reason. Um, so C out could not open file. Now let's see if we can ever actually get that error to happen. What have I done? Why are you? Oh, I put the semicolon inside the quote rather than out. Could not open file. So that's all that that does. I think the syntax is goofy looking. I don't like that. They showed us another way of doing it. Is open, I believe. Nope. There was something about like dot fail or something. Dot fail, was that it? But I'm not sure. Okay, that sounds right. Okay, let me go back and change this uh, file.txt. All right, so that worked. That's another way to check to see if it's if it opened. And the book mentioned one more way: if out file dot fail, or if not fail, like that, you know, then then do something. I like that one. If the file is open, go ahead and do something with it. But you don't have to do that. That way, it's just as valid. Slightly shorter syntax. So if you haven't done the file I.O. BMR assignment, now you know how. The only thing I'd like for you to change from this, besides the fact that it's printing an awesomeness rating, which is stupid, right? You're just going to display all the same stuff that you were putting on the screen at the end of your program after your calculations into the file. But ask them for the file name. Don't hard code it like that. Static local variables. Oh my. Did we talk about the static keyword? I don't think we did. I do think we did. I'm getting confused as to whether we did or not. We are going to use a static variable, and a static variable is one that maintains its value between calls. So find main down here, and we're going to make a little silly test function. I don't care what it's called. Void get name. So string name is equal to blah, blah, empty quote. Now let's see out. Enter your name, question mark. Let's see in into that name variable. And let's pr print out a message. You entered, end quote, followed by the name, followed by ENDL. But just to be weird, we're going to print out the value of the name variable before they type in anything. So go up above that first C out and do before data entry comma name equals end quote arrow arrow name arrow arrow ENDL. So by all rights what are we expecting to happen? And it is actually what happens. What is it going to print here? It 
What did we just set the name variable to? We set it equal to something blank. Um, I'm, instead, I'm going to change it to I don't know. So when we run it, it's, it's going to say before data entry, name is equal to I don't know. And then it's going to say enter your name. And after we type in a name, it's going to say you entered blah, blah, blah. So let's call that function get name. Let's call it three times. We're going to get tired of typing in our name, but this is just going to prove a point. Each time we run it, it's going to print before data entry, name is equal to I don't know. Before data entry, name is equal to I don't know. What is your name? Jeff. You enter Jeff. Before data entry, name is equal to I don't know. Enter your name. I said it was Jeff. Enter your name. Jeff, dang it. And then it starts doing something else because we call that function three times. Put the word static in front of that variable declaration. What static means is that it's a local variable, but it doesn't get wiped out when it hits that. It maintains the value between calls to the function. So the first time we run it, it's going to say I don't know before data name, name is equal to I don't know, and then enter your name. But the second time we come back in here, it's going to have maintained the last value we set in it. So if I enter Jeff, then it's going to say before data entry, name is equal to Jeff. What's your name? Jeff. You enter Jeff. Before data entry, your name is equal to Jeff. That's different than it was before, right? It was printing I don't know every time. But now it's keeping the last value. And if I type in Bob, it's going to say you entered Bob, and then when it comes back to before data entry, it's going to say name is equal to Bob. So this is no longer erasing the value, resetting the value of that variable each time. That's what static means. Static means that it maintains that value between calls. Let's give one more example of that. We're going to write two functions, one called dumb counter and one called smart counter. int dumb counter, parentheses in parentheses, int x is equal to 0, x plus plus, return x. Every single time we call dumb counter, what is it going to return? Well, it starts off at 0, right? Then what happens? We add 1 to it, so x is now 1, and then we return it. Then if we call it again, x is set back to 0. We add 1 to it, and we return a 1 again. So no matter how many times we call it, it's always going to return 1. Let's just kind of prove that to ourselves. So here, C out, arrow, arrow, dumb underscore counter, parentheses in parentheses, arrow, arrow, ENDL. And just copy that and do it five times. Two, three, four, five. Every time it goes, it's just going to print one. So we're going to see five ones on the screen. One, 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 one. Great. Not much of a counter. Now we're going to make one called smart counter. Copy this entire function, paste it, and call it smart counter, and put the word static in front of int. I'll do that right now. I'm going to copy this entire function, not cut, copy, control C or command C for the Mac user, paste it, change dumb to smart and add the word static here. Now go down to main and call the smart counter five times in a row. So C out, arrow, arrow, smart underscore counter, parentheses in parentheses, arrow, arrow, ENDL. Now do that five times in a row. Once, twice, three times, four times, five times. And that's going to act like an honest-to-goodness counter.
One, two, three, four, five. What's the difference? What do we do to make it work? Besides change the word to smart, that didn't magically fix it, right? We made the variable static, which means it does not get reset every time we go into that function. It maintains the last value. So the first time we go in, static is, excuse me, x is in fact 0, but it gets bumped up to 1. The second time, after we re-enter the function, it's still equal to 1. It does not get reset, so then when we add 1 to it, it becomes 2, and so on. Every time we call the function, it's not getting set back to 0. It maintains its value, so then it would be 3, and then it would be 4, and then it would be 5. That's what the static keyword does. And then when you get to object-oriented programming, it means something almost completely different. And if, when you take Java, you're going to see the word static all over the place, and it doesn't mean the same thing. Sorry about that. I don't know why they didn't use another keyword for all the purposes, which you will see. But thankfully, we're not in Java, so you don't have to worry about it right now, right? Some of y'all are. So static local variables retain their contents between function calls. They are initialized only the first time the function is called. If you didn't set a value for it, it's just like a global variable. It defaults to being 0. So I did not actually have to say static x is equal to 0. I could have just said static x. But I don't mind that 0. It doesn't hurt anything to see it. Default arguments. Here we just introduced arguments, and we're already giving them defaults. We're going to write a happy birthday function. So it doesn't need to return anything, so void. We're going to call it b-day for birthday. It's going to take somebody's name as a parameter, and we're going to use a for loop to print out happy birthday five times. For int x is equal to zero, x is less than five, x plus plus, c out happy birthday, comma, space, end quote, followed by their name, followed by endl, followed by an exclamation mark and a backslash in. As a matter of fact, we don't need that ENDL because I meant to have the exclamation mark take care of it. Okay, so I took that ENDL out. Happy birthday, end quote, arrow, arrow, name, arrow, arrow, quote, exclamation mark, backslash in. So, down in Maine, we're going to say happy birthday. B day, and we're going to pass in somebody's name. Arnold's birthday, whoever he is. So it should say, Happy Birthday, Arnold, and it's going to say it five times. Happy Birthday, Arnold, Happy Birthday. What if you wanted to call it like this for whatever purposes? Not sure why, but what if you wanted to be able to call it like this? I'm going to take that comma out because it's going to look bad. No, I'm going to leave it in. Anyways, that's an error. Why is that an error? Because this is demanding that we pass in one argument. But we don't have one argument. We have no arguments. So since we have a parameter here, we're supposed to have an argument here that matches. And we don't. But what we can do is go, well, if you didn't give me a name, oh, why don't I just say you person comma you. This is silly, but then when we run it, first time it says, Happy Birthday, Arnold, Happy Birthday, Arnold. And then, since they did not provide a name, it says, Happy Birthday, you person, you. Happy Birthday, you person, you. I think that's really annoying, so I'm just going to change this to you, like that. So this is a default value. Since we didn't pass in that argument, this parameter gets 
the value of u. Does that make sense? You can pass in a value, and if you pass in Arnold, then that's what name gets. But if you don't pass in anything, then the name variable is set to u. You don't have to give default values for your arguments. If you do, you can put them into more than one. But if you're mixing them to where you have arguments, parameters with default values and parameters without default values, you can only do them in this order. The ones without default values go first, and then the ones with them go second. You can't do this. Int x is equal to 0, int y, int z is equal to 0. That won't work. That would be an error. If you are going to have parameters with default values and parameters without default values, the ones without default values have to come first. So that's valid. It would compile, but doing it the other way wouldn't. But if you want to, you can make all three of them have default values. Does that mean that you'd recklessly need to go and add a default value for every parameter? Absolutely not. Only if it makes sense. So here they have something called display stars. And they don't show us the code for the display stars method, but we may as well do it. This is a good little exercise. What it's going to do is use for loops. And if we say display stars 10 comma 3, it's going to put 10 stars in a row and then three rows. So 10 columns by three rows. I think we've done something like that before. So let's write that as a function. Void display underscore stars int rows comma int columns. And we're just going to have two for loops to handle this. Nested loops. For int r is equal to 0, r is less than a number of rows, r plus plus. Then the same thing for c. Except c is going to be less than a number of columns. For parentheses int c is equal to 0, c is less than a number of columns, c plus plus. Inside our nested loop, let's write out an asterisk. But don't put an ENDL. Outside of our nested loop, we are going to print out the asterisk. Excuse me, not the asterisk, but the ENDL. Right, because this is printing out every column in the row. So it's going to go dot, 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 dot. But once we're out of the loop, then we want to go to the next line, like hitting enter on the typewriter. Then it comes back and it prints out another row. And we hit enter on the typewriter. And you know, we keep doing that until we are done with all of our rows. Let's tack that on. Let's make a call to that inside main. All right, guys, just so that I can get all the code on the same page, I'm going to put these opening braces on the same line like that. Don't modify your code to do that. Just know that that's what I did. So I can call display underscore stars and say that I want five rows, and each row is going to have ten stars. And there we go. Or did I say three rows? It's supposed to be five rows. What did I do wrong? Oh, it just it wasn't scrolled up. Okay. So there we go. There's our five rows with ten stars per row. What if we wanted to be exceptionally lazy and just call it like this, display stars with no values? Well, it's going to have to pick how many stars. So let's put some default values in. What are our default values? 
we want default value to be six rows with four columns, right? So I just changed int rows to be int rows is equal to six and int columns to be int columns is equal to four. So now when I run it, if I give it values, great, it would print out five rows, 10 wide. But I didn't, so it's going to print out six rows, four wide. And we see that that's the case, six rows, four wide. We can make it four by six and make it 10 by 20, whatever, you know, 10 rows by 20 columns is our default values now. Run them. Then when I scroll up to see what it looks like, sure enough, I have 10 rows with 20 in them. Or I can specify how many rows and how many columns I want. So you can write functions that accept default values if you don't want to pass value, if sometimes you want to pass values in and sometimes you don't. But like I said, you don't have to go nuts always giving a default value. If it makes absolutely no sense, like this happy birthday one was really kind of stupid. I really want our program to pass in a good name so it just doesn't say happy birthday you. But we did. If the program calls it without any value inside the uh, parentheses like that, then at least it prints something. Happy birthday, comma, you. Guess that makes them feel better than nothing. Reference variables. Almost feel like we're going too far too fast, but I don't know what to do about that. There's something else in a chapter we could cover instead of reference variables and save that for a day. Overloading functions. This one I don't mind covering. The idea of reference parameters is just completely different. I won't say completely different, but uh, we'll go back to it on Thursday. Overloading functions. Overloading functions is not a bad thing. It sounds bad. Captain, the engines are overloaded. We're all going to die. No, no. Overloading can be a good thing. What overloading means is writing two functions with the same name but with different parameter lists. So for example, say we wanted a function that would add two numbers. So we write one, int add, and it takes two values, int x comma int y. And what it does is it returns x plus y. So down in our code, we call that, you know, int r, r is equal to add 2 and 10. After that was done, r would equal 12. And what if you wanted to do this? r is equal to add 2 comma 3 comma 4. That's not going to work because this guy is explicitly wired to only accept two arguments. He only has two parameters defined. So we can't pass in three arguments. And then, you know, our fellow team member says, well, I really wanted to take four, like that. Well, that's not going to work either. These are all syntax errors except for the first one. The reason this first one works is because the function requires, it has two parameters, so it requires two arguments. But you can't pass in three into two. You can't pass in four into two. But we can write other versions of the add function that accept three arguments and four arguments. Let's do that. int add, int x, int y, comma, int z, and let's return x plus y plus z. Now that takes care of that second case. Now this is no longer a syntax error.
So this one's still a syntax error. Write a version of the add function that will accept four parameters. And unfortunately, I've already used x, y, and z. What comes after z? Just call it a. So write a, fun a version of the add function that accepts four parameters. Call them x, y, z, and a. And then make it return, you know, x plus y plus z plus a. Go ahead and do that. So, int add, int x, int y, int z, int a, and return x plus y plus z plus a. Perfect. Everything's great. Now, somebody else throws us a loop. What if they wanted to do this? C out add 10.1 to 11. Point two. Followed by an E and DL. Or, yeah, let, let, let's write this out a little long form. Double D. D is equal to add 10.5, comma, 1.5. Let's see if that even builds. It did build, but if we printed out the answer, it's not going to be what we want. Let's go ahead and write out what D is. C out D after the add is, end quote, arrow, arrow, D, arrow, arrow, E, and DL. And we're going to have to scroll all the way to the top of our input to see it, but we can do this. So what is 10.5 plus 1.5? That ought to be 12, right? But when it runs, we don't get 12. What do we get? First person to run it, tell me what it actually prints out. It prints out 11. And why is that? Because these are doubles. These are ints. So they're being rounded down to convert them to be ints. Because you can't have int x equals 10.5 x can only be 10. So we can write one more version of the add function that accepts doubles. Let's do that. Get, except it's not going to be an int anymore, right? We want it to return a double. So double add, and then double d1. Decided to steer away from uh, x, y, and z. Double d1 comma, double D2, and this is going to return D1 plus D2. Now that code, when it runs, will actually give us 12 rather than 11. I hope. Yep. So D after the add is 12. So if we call add with integers, it calls one of those functions. But if we call add with doubles, it calls the other function. So we have one, ver one method name, add, that accepts all sorts of different data types. Now, honestly, probably what we ought to do would be to delete all of these and to replace them with versions that only accepted doubles. Why? Because you could convert ints to doubles, no problem. Yeah, so, you know, we'd want to get rid of all of these, but then write a second and third and fourth version that accepted D1, D2, and D3, and D1, D2, D3, and D4. The code would work just as well if we did that because ints get converted to doubles with no problem, right? There's no rounding when you turn a whole number into a, a floating point number. It's only when you're going the other way that it's a problem. So that's overloading. Overloading is writing code where this, you have the function names with the same name but different parameter lists to make it more flexible so that we don't have to think as hard to write. 
Uh, we could have made the code look like this. Add to, add three, don't type this, add four, right? And add two D for two doubles. We could have given them all sorts of different names, but then when I'm writing my code, I have to remember, okay, oh, I needed to put the D in there or else it's not gonna get me the right version. It's better just to overload it. And again, you can go nuts and do overloading when you don't need to. Just because you know that the concept is there doesn't mean that every function you write has to have overloading. But if it makes sense, you can put it there. Okay, the last thing I want you all to do to this code is we've written a whole bunch of functions, right? Way too many functions. Take this int main down at the bottom, all of it, get all of int main, including the very closing brace, cut it, and put it above your first function, underneath the namespace. So I cut main from the bottom. I'm going up here and I'm pasting it underneath namespace. And that's going to just break it completely, right? What do we got to do to fix it? I mean, compile it. You'll see that there are errors. What do we do to fix it? Somebody knows. It'll be a long evening. Mm -hmm. Tell me what we got to do to fix it. Prototypes. We've learned about prototypes. Prototypes are what you use in order to get functions to be called if they're not defined above it. So for these calls right here, add one, add two, add three, or whatever, we can't use those. If we go and look at the error list, it says add is not found. Why is it not found? Because it was it's down at the bottom now. So you have to put a prototype for it. I'm going to go find the add function and put a prototype. There we go. Add. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to paste it, either above or below the namespace, and just put a semicolon there. That gets rid of one of the errors. But there are a whole bunch of them because we moved a whole bunch of methods. We moved a whole bunch of functions. Sorry. So now go through and put enough prototypes in here to get your code to run. Now that you've moved main up to the top, you're going to have a lot of functions. But just go through one by one. Find all your functions. We had one called get input. You better make it a prototype. Copy it. Go up to the top. Paste it. Add a semicolon. And just keep doing that. And I'm going to wander around and help y'all uh, make sure that everybody's got the concept going. So, something I wasn't expecting, I forgot about, as I had y'all create your prototypes, it's complaining about the default arguments. I need to move main back up because I moved it down while the uh, camera was off. guess I don't have to for this point. Anyways, where's one of ours that has default arguments? This display stars method. I'm going to make a prototype for it. Scroll up to the top. Here we go. Where'd my prototypes go? I guess I deleted them all. Anyways, so there we go. Let's build it. Let's see if it works. And we have some errors. Redefinition of default parameter. We can only have defaults provided in one place. So let's try taking them out of the prototype. Let's see if that works. Looks like it did. OK. So in your prototypes, remove any default values you might have had. So display stars had a default value and also the B day method where we had a default value for the name. Right for the string. So when I create a prototype for the B day function, put a semicolon at the end, but I have to take the default value out. It occurs to me that it's probably also plausible that the default value be left in the prototype and removed from the other function. Let's see if that's the case. I'm not sure that that'll work. Yep. So you can have the default values either in the prototype or in the function declaration, but not in both. 
So that's how you fix it. All right, once you get it to working again, once you've moved all the prototypes up to the top and removed the default values from them, you're good to go. Let's go ahead and upload into our Dropbox. So if you refresh your Dropbox, you'll see a Dropbox R. Get that up in there and you're good to go. Now I'm going to wander around and make sure everybody gets it going. Any questions before I shut the recorder off? All right, so I'll, I'll come back and help.